created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We are thankful, O oh Lord, that by your will we can once again meet corporately to worship and bless your holy name. Lord, this morning we want to lift up our fellow brothers and sisters who are persecuted, especially those who are experiencing rejection by their families because of the name of Jesus. Many of them are in Muslim-ran countries under Sharia law, and we ask you that you may keep them strong and faithful, because it has been granted to believers in Christ that for his sake we should not only believe in him, but also to suffer for his name, the name above all names. Lord, as much as we are encouraged by their boldness, we pray that we may stand firm in our own country and evermore preach Christ and him crucified. We also pray for theological institutions in the world and those in our beloved South Africa. We specifically pray for George Whitfield College to stand firm and not give in to a liberal agenda that desires to pollute every sphere of life. Protect the college against the scheme of, schemes of Satan. And I pray for every seminarian to stand bold for the name of Jesus Christ, no matter what. As the leadership retreat is happening on Saturday, please, Lord, bless the plans that will be discussed as 2024 is on the horizon. Bless our staff and council in this church, and may you be glorified at that meeting. Shine your light through Pastor Ray this morning, Lord, and may your word go out in power and not return void. Please, O oh Lord, open the hearts this morning to receive your word, and perhaps this day is the day of salvation for many, if you so will, my God. In Christ alone we pray. Amen. Morning everyone, our reading is taken from Mark 3, reading from verse 1 to 35. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus, to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good? or to do harm, to save a life or to kill. But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Rodians against him, how to destroy him. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed him from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem, and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, 
and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he cast out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, He has an unclean spirit. And his mother and, and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as ominous a night as our passage strikes, I'm excited about bringing this word to you. I hope you're excited every time about opening up and listening to God in His word. Uh, thank you for the preparation that you've helped us do as we've participated together in singing. Well done for that last song, In Sync. Uh, especially Penny and Roby, husband and wife. In Sync. Great job. Now, as has already been um, indicated in the service, our focus has been very much on praying and thinking about those who suffer rejection, persecution. In the past few weeks, I've received a number of emails, some which I subscribe to, relating to the persecuted church, such as Voice of the Martyrs, that each week, in fact, and sometimes a few times a week, send out prayer needs for those who are persecuted in the world for the name of Jesus, with titles like Hindu Radicals in Pakistan Burn Christians' Homes, Islamists Kill Six Christians in Nigeria, After Adnan Turned to Christ, His Father Wanted to Kill Him. This was a headline, in fact, in Facebook that our newest uh, Cape Era bishop posted, a man by the name of Garang, who studied at George Woodfield College, was attacked in his home in South Sudan with machetes. He is recovering in hospital. He has a bit of a longer story from one of those reflections. Ever since 24-year-old Miracle Conte left a secret society in Sierra Leone to follow Jesus Christ 10 years ago, her grandmother, who led the society, has tried to kill her. For two years, Miracle, known as Sasa, until coming to faith in Christ at age 14, performed ancient rituals that involved interacting with demons, casting spells, and performing bodily mutilations. She interacted with dark spirits so often that she said she always sensed the presence of evil spirits all around her. One evening, as Miracle's grandmother was visiting another village, a Christian pastor arrived with a projector and a small screen. He had come to the village to share the Jesus film. As she watched the film, Miracle realized that Jesus was the one who had protected Christians when she and her grandmother had tried to take control of them through the dark spirit realm. After placing her faith in Christ, she decided to attend a church service. When Miracle's grandmother returned and learned what Miracle had done, she ordered others in the society to kill her. Just one of many true stories 
happening in our world right now, in our own continent, in our own backyard, as people seek the blood of Christians simply for putting their faith in Jesus. It's the tenor of our passage this morning. We get to grips with why this rejection, why this violent reaction, what's really going on beneath this. But we see a number of stories of rejection in our passage this morning. And Mark, in true Mark style, carries us along quite quickly. And we're going to go through quickly, so of necessity, our bird's eye view won't touch on every detail. And again, I urge you to read those sections in chapter 2 and 3 that we're going to deal with, and perhaps devotionally ponder them and pray in particular for the persecuted church as we have this morning. Immediately, Mark says, remember, I reminded you of that, to carry our action along. But it's not merely to show us this growing advance of the kingdom, but also the growing tension surrounding Jesus. And it takes some pace in our chapter, in our passage today. It happens very quickly as they end up plotting to do away with Jesus already by chapter 3 in Mark's Gospel. We've seen hints of it, of course, that not everybody was embracing Jesus wholeheartedly. Not everyone was excited to welcome him to their town. Not everyone was flocking around Jesus to enjoy the fruits of his ministry. No, there were many who were concerned about this renegade rabbi who seemed to go against the establishment, who made claims that were either radical or just downright blasphemous, according to them. And sadly, the opposition came chiefly from the religious establishment. Those referred to as the Pharisees, the scribes, and the teachers of the law. The guardians and shepherds of the religious life of Israel were at least who were meant to be. And so in this next section of Mark's Gospel, which we'll look at this morning, we have a number of confrontations between Jesus and the religious establishment. And the tension quickly escalates, such that by the end of the section, they are writing off Jesus as evil as Satan himself, and are determined to destroy him. Let's just bow our heads for a moment, and then we're going to look at those who reject the king, and then those who are received by the king. We're looking at foes and family, if you like. Let's pray. O oh, Father, help us as we tread the dark waters of these chapters to see the light of Christ that cannot be put out. Help us to ponder and to be aware of how many face such severe opposition because of their love for Jesus, which we hardly experience, though it's here. And help us as a result to be more bold for the name of Jesus, as a church and as individuals, that you might be honoured and glorified. Our time is short. Make us aware of that. And help us to keep the main thing, the main thing, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's look firstly then at those who reject the king. And again, as I mentioned, we're going to do a very um, brief overview of these accounts. Starting in chapter 2, so I know we began reading in chapter 3, but I want you to keep your Bibles open and cast your eyes there to the first account of rejection of Jesus in our section, and that's from verse 18 of chapter 2. The first group of people there are not identified they seem to have, though, a legitimate question. They say, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? Jesus, you're, you're doing things differently. You're not conforming. Why? It seems a genuine query. Rabbi Jesus, you're breaking our traditions, particularly here, our tradition to fast. Now, thanks to the Pharisees, particularly, which come up more prominently later. Fasting was something that was more and more commonplace in Jesus' day. Though there was only actually one prescribed fast in the Old Testament, that was on the Day of Atonement, the Pharisees had turned it into something of, well, turned themselves into something of super fasters. They fasted on Monday and Thursday. Perhaps they ate steers on Wacky Wednesday. But they did fast, and they fasted a lot. Fasting was meant to be a matter of inward reflection and a mourning over sin. 
The Jews of Jesus' day, however, were fasting to commemorate and mourn over the great disasters of the past and what had happened to them. It had shifted slightly from a real consideration of their own hearts to, oh, woe is us, look at what's happened. And indeed, though on the surface it might have appeared as a very right and religious thing to do, we'll see later on that Jesus points out that actually they were just doing this for the outward, particular Pharisees. They weren't really concerned about the heart. They were holding on to this tradition of fasting as if it somehow would make them a little bit better in God's books. Just another way. They were using the law to make themselves right with God, at least in their eyes. But on the surface, they reject Jesus because he doesn't fit the mold. He doesn't do as he's always, as always has been done or expected of a rabbi. He's a renegade. And Mark places this account to kind of introduce to us this escalating tension which is going to happen. The first reason really for their rejection here is they fail to see the truth of the times. They fail to see the truth of the times. Have a look at how Jesus responds to them. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Now, yes, you should get excited about the word bridegroom. There's great themes in Scripture that pick that up. Though they wouldn't have known yet, because there's no indication in the Old Testament that Jesus referring himself to the bridegroom and the bride to come. That comes later. Perhaps as Mark's readers read this, they started to think of that. But what he's really saying here is this is a time for celebration and joy. It's not a time for fasting and mourning. There is such a time coming for at least one of our church members. And we should say this, well done, Gerald Kutsia. Well done, Hannah. Looking forward to just over a week's time getting married. Sorry, I'm outing now, but here it is. Um, now, sadly, we're not celebrating a Proteus victory in the World Cup, and yet, oh, how great was Gerald throughout the World Cup? Just brilliant, and as a young man, first World Cup, great stuff. They're sad, obviously. They're downcast. Maybe they're fasting. I doubt it. Well, Indian food, maybe they're fasting. I think he hits town again today. But he's got great reason, and his biggest challenge, arguably, is not any cricket, but getting married. Not because Hannah's a challenge. He's excited. It's wonderful. But that's the reason for celebration and joy, and we're looking forward to that. Next week, it's right. It's appropriate. That's what Jesus is saying here. It's appropriate because this is the new time. It's the messianic time. It's the time of the king arriving. It's the time of the messiah Fasting is not appropriate. Feasting is. Because he is here. He is with them. And if you really took the scriptures seriously, as intimating, is you would recognize that the time of fulfillment is now upon you. This new era. That's why it goes on, and I won't read it now. There's other parables. It's actually the first set of parables here. Um, Jobs will help us understand parables more in chapter 4. And the, the way Jesus uses them also to kind of push them a little bit. They're either going to reach out for more understanding or they're going to back away. And the parables act like that kind of sifting process. And he wants them to reach out, but they, in their rejection of him, have already made up their mind. He doesn't fit the mold, and therefore, we turn our backs on him. And Jesus is saying, what you're really not doing is you're failing to see the truth of the times. Now is the time to celebrate. This is the new messianic era. You must conform to Jesus, not make Jesus conform to you and try and fit him in to your old garment, it's simply going to be disastrous. You need to see how he fulfills all that was promised. Let's have a look at the second and third controversy. I'll do them together at the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3 because they both take place on the Sabbath. They're both questions of the Sabbath. I'm not going to answer all your questions about the Sabbath today and how we observe it. I simply want you to see the interaction and the reason for the rejection of him. Now these groups are clearly identified by Mark. Chapter uh, 2, verse 23. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now you might think, well, what's the big deal? Why do they 
attack Jesus' disciples for doing this. Surely it's a bit like, you know, me and my family walking down the street, going for a walk and then picking some mulberries off somebody's mulberry tree or, and, uh, you know, just having some snacks along the way. But it's the Sabbath, and Sabbath is a big deal, especially for the Pharisees. According to the Pharisees, you know what Jesus' disciples are doing? They're working because they're harvesting. It sounds ludicrous to our ears, but that's against Sabbath law, according to them. And as we see in the next instant, the beginning of chapter 3, now they're actively watching in the synagogue because the Sabbath and the synagogue and Jesus brought together provide a great opportunity for them to find a way to accuse him, to catch him out. Now they want to see if Jesus is going to work on the Sabbath. Well, according to them, of course he is. Look at this. They watched Jesus, verse 2 of chapter 3, to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, who was there in the synagogue, come here. And he says to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm, to save a life or kill? But they were silent. On this key verse for our whole section, he looked around at them with anger. Why is he angry? I've just missed it. They've just got it so wrong because, secondly, they're rejecting him because they failed to see the tenor. They failed to hear, if you like, the tone or the tenor of the law. You've missed it. You've got it wrong. And look what's happening in its stead. You are okay to see people continue suffering because of your law. They failed to see, to hear the tone of the law. Jesus looked around at them in anger, verse 5, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. Is he going to work? Well, according to them, indeed he does. Jesus answers quite deliberately. Even though this man's condition is not life-threatening, he does it really on purpose to show them up. By the end of this incident, the Pharisees are plotting with the Herodians to kill him. That escalated quickly, didn't it? Verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him. How to destroy him, it's a strong word. We must get him and get rid of him. Now that's a bit of a surprise, that the Herodians and the Pharisees are plotting together. They didn't like each other very much at all. It's been registration weekend, I think still today, here in our country. For the elections next year, maybe you've gone out to register or check that you're registered. And we know what happens with our politics and the, particularly the alliances that are made, political parties made, to try and actually further their own agendas and their own positions, and yet they're willing to unite on things that they don't agree on, at least on the surface anyway, hoping that they can get the one up and they can get the power. But then we see not too long after sometimes these alliances simply fall apart because of the upsetness, and this doesn't work for me, it doesn't fit. Well, the Herodians and the Pharisees didn't see eye to eye. Herodians were supporters of King Herod. They wanted to keep the status quo of rule and society. They had the power and they wanted to keep things that way. Too much political unrest spelled trouble, and the threat of the Romans coming to destroy them was too much to deal with, of course. The Pharisees were religious sick. They had no political power. But they didn't believe that the Herodians were authorized to rule. But the only thing they could really agree on was getting rid of Jesus. And so these enemies unite and conspire together against a common enemy. Jesus now is an enemy of the world. They're happy to put aside those differences and work together to get rid of Jesus. Let me just say this, because I know sometimes in our minds, as we read about the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law, we're already thinking bad guys. And that is true, yes, as Jesus confronts them clearly. But just remember this as you read these sections. They were considered far from that in their day. They were considered the good guys. They were highly respected, considered exemplary in their lives, greatly respected. They had an important role to confront error and deal with any deviations from religious integrity and indeed societal integrity, at least as far as they saw it. As far as Jewish society was concerned, they were the law and order. They were viewed as good guys. Just remember that. 
we have this instinct to just jump in. Oh, there's the bad guys again. That's not how they were seen. Yet Jesus, of course, exposes them as tragic failures of shepherds. They become corrupted. They become wolves. They had turned God's law into a heavy yoke. In this account of the Sabbath, this is what's happening here. Jesus exposes that. In fact, they've added some 600 and more of their own laws and bylaws to God's law. It had become onerous. And the more laws they added and their view kept, they were a okay And you could be too if you went along this route. It was all about legalism, outward action, to impress others and impress God. They were masters of that, and you'll see how that comes to a head in chapter 7. You'll see the real problem. That they failed to hear the real tone of the law. Why God has given his law in the first place. And Jesus' response to these Sabbath controversies shows us how deaf they were to the true purpose of God's law and how they'd misused it and how they'd become a yoke on the neck of people to burden them. The Pharisees had turned it into a performance checklist. When they read their Bibles, it was to assure themselves of how good they were. In fact, so good, they did God a favor and added a whole lot of extra laws he left out. The Sabbath was one of their particular areas of expertise. Now, look, we don't have time to go into the detail of Jesus' response, but his response shows up their legalism. And Jesus underlines the true purpose of the law. The goal of his law is love, not legalism. It's not a way for you to be right with God, but to reveal the desperate sickness in your heart, just as the sick man is there in the synagogue. And to turn your gaze to faith in the Father so that you can be straightened out by him. You can't straighten yourself out. So turn your gaze to faith in the Father through the Son, who pardons in his grace. And you find a true straightness. You find the withered soul of your life opened up to new life and to usefulness. That's the purpose of his law, to guide us wisely and lovingly, first to the cross as we see our need, and then in paths of righteousness for our good and the good of others, which was far from what was happening here in the synagogue. You remember that? story of the teacher in the Sunday school. I don't think any of our teachers do this. But in teaching the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, you remember the story? And the Pharisee prays, actually to himself it literally says, thank you God that I'm not like that tax collector. And after the teachers taught this to the class, she says that she's pointed out how the Pharisee is legalistic and the tax collector has a true understanding of the need for mercy, which the Pharisee needs. And then the teacher says, now before we pray, children, let us thank God that we are not like the Pharisee. (laughs) Mm, Quite against the point, isn't it? We are more Pharisee-like than we like to imagine. We blow it in our Christian lives and we think, oh, tomorrow I'll try extra good. Tomorrow I'll come to church. And I'll do it and God will be happy with me. It's counter grace, isn't it? We are Pharisees in our hearts, so often. We miss the point just like them. The final incident of rejection, as far as the religious establishment is concerned, is in chapter 3, verse 22, that was read to us this time. It's the scribes. The scribes were scripture copyists. They, they were Israel's um, copy men. They, they took their job very seriously. They were to copy Israel's sacred literature, to preserve it. They were masters of Hebrew law. They knew their Bibles. They had to copy it again and again and make sure it was on point. Now they come and they say, verse 22, he is possessed by Beelzebul. Something like Baal of the gods. But they relate that to Satan. He is possessed. Do you see how this has progressed? Maybe just being a little indignant with Jesus and then seeing the, the peril. And now they are writing off Jesus as evil as Satan himself. That's their conclusion. Jesus is evil. 
Now, this is a really important section to help us understand the heart of the problem. But essentially here, on the surface, they reject Jesus because if first it was a failure to see the truth of the times, if second it was a failure to hear the tone of the law, thirdly, it's a failure to grasp the testimony of the obvious, where the true power of God comes from, where Jesus' power comes from. That's what they fail to see. But this section, more than anything, helps us understand what's beneath all of these surface rejections of Jesus. And so at the risk of making you hungry, I want to read the whole thing. Uh, hungry, I mean, because there's a sandwich here. Remember I talked about sandwiches in Mark's Gospel? Um, that is, two pieces of bread and the meat in the middle. This unpacks this for us. So look out for the sandwich, the two pieces of correlating bread, and the meat in the middle. I'm going to read to you from chapter 3, verse 20. He went home and the crowd gathered so that he could not even eat. And when his family heard of it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. I'll give you a clue. Here's your first piece of bread. Here's the meat. And the scribes came and said, he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. And he talks to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he's coming to an end. You guys haven't thought this through very well. You're out of your minds to think like that. It just wouldn't work. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say, and this is a terrifying verse for a number of people, but we need to understand it in its context. All sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And, verse 31, his mother and brothers came. Standing outside, they sent to him and called to him. Piece of bread number two. Okay. You see it? In other words... Here is rejection from his family, his own biological family, that bracket this section. And in the middle, we have rejection again portrayed to us from, if you like, the Israelite family, the family of God, God's people. Well, what's really going on? See, Mark places it here to communicate to us that the rejection of his biological family and the rejection of Israel, of Jesus, is really of the same kind. In fact, the words in 321 carry us into that middle section. They were saying he is out of his mind. It's a continuous idea, continuous flow. And the word sees there is a shockingly strong one. It's to take charge and to silence him, just as Jesus did the demons. They wanted to do to him they are openly in rebellion against him, both his family and the religious establishment. Maybe his family were embarrassed at the commotion. Maybe there was shame brought upon their family they were worried about. Perhaps they're nervous of the tension being stirred up, or they've been pressed by the religious authorities to do something about your son. His family is seeking to do something about it, but they're driven by rejection of him that is of the same kind as the rest of the rejections we've seen. Instead, the commentator Jason Mayer says this of the family's rejection of Jesus, his own family. This is a startling reminder that proximity to Jesus is not enough. Allegiance to Jesus is what matters. How many people, even here in our own city, think, I've got the Jesus thing, I go to church, I've got my Bible, I'm okay. I've got that proximity. I know the answers. It's not enough. It's allegiance. It's surrender. It's trust in Jesus. That matters. Mary, it seems at the time, wasn't proudly saying, that's my boy. That's my boy. What's he doing? And so you see, just like the scribes, the fact that he has power is undeniable. Everyone can see it and its effects. 
And so the only other option is that Jesus is doing these things by harnessing evil spiritual power. Jesus is an agent of the devil. In fact, he's bound by Satan and doing his bidding. And of course, Jesus just goes on to show the foolishness of such claim. And even the demons themselves could have probably pointed out. In fact, do you notice the only ones who speak a true word about Jesus here in this section are the demons? The unclean spirits in chapter 33, verse 11. They know who he is. You are the Son of God. Jesus says, stop it. You want those who are recognized as liars being on your PR team, do you? The only ones who say a true word about him. But of course, as James, brother of Jesus, yes, he came to trust his brother Jesus, says later in his letter, even the demons believe and shudder. But that's not enough too. Of course, theirs is not a saving faith. You can see that. You can acknowledge that there's a God and he's powerful. You might even acknowledge that Jesus is his son, the Christ, and still not be saved. Allegiance is the issue. Trust is the issue. In Mark, highlighting the irony of their accusation of him being controlled by demonic power, whilst they are really the ones bound by Satan and doing his bidding, striving to silence him. Because of their rejection of him, their situation is no better than those who are demon-possessed. They are controlled by Satan himself, and so, friends, is everyone who does not trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour, Lord and Treasure. You are in Satan's camp, according to Jesus. He is your Father, and you do his bidding in this world. Until that moment comes, when you see the light, and know him as King, and know his grace alone, which saves you. It is the only way. Let me not leave you there. They fail to grasp the testimony of the obvious. But all of those surface rejections are really at its heart. Beneath it all is a rejection of the authority of King Jesus. That's what's really going on. To reject his authority over the Sabbath, the rest which he gave to humanity as a gift, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. To reject his authority in this releasing, saving, forgiving gospel, the only way to be saved, as evidenced by his power poured out, to point to the fact that he has come to not be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The real reason, friends, that your friends and family reject Jesus no matter the objections that they might voice, no matter the fine-sounding arguments, no matter the questions that come your way, the real reason is they do not want Jesus to be an authority over them. They don't want to have him in control. I want to continue living my own life. That's the heart of sin. That's the heart of rebellion. I don't want Jesus to take control. That's the essence of this rejection. So you can write him off as mad, as his own family do. You can write him off as bad, evil, as the religious establishment do. But there is only one real option, and he is. He is not mad, he is not bad, he is God. Another person put it this way, he is either a lunatic, he is either a liar, or he is Lord. Those are the only options you have when it comes to Jesus. Friend, what have you done with him? How do you see him? When you embrace him as Lord, remember it means everything. That allegiance is surrender by faith your whole life. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. Oh, come, my Savior. Oh, come to me. And he comes. And I want to end on this note in the passage. You would have noticed in our section, there's a rather odd placement of Jesus calling his disciples, those whom he wanted, and then sending them and designating them as apostles, which means sent ones. 
and then renaming some of them. Sons of Thunder, hey, there's a mission's name if ever you want it. We should call our mission uh, organization. How about that for our C4 Missions Committee? The Thunder Team. No, never mind. <laughs> Makes me think of the Thunder Cats when I was growing up. But now I'm digressing. Don't miss what happens here. What is Jesus doing in calling disciples and sending them? In the midst of this passage, why does Mark place it here? In the midst of all this rejection, in the midst of all of this doom and gloom, in the midst of kill the king, which we don't see as a king. What he's saying, my mission is unstoppable. It's going to continue, and it's going to continue through those whom I draw. It's going to continue through my church. And guess what it is, isn't it? You're here. You're part of that commission. You're not apostles. They were unique. They were special. But we stand on apostolic ministry, and we preach apostolic words of the kingdom. It's going to continue, and it has to, and it's irresistible. And you see what else he's doing? He's calling his family together. In the midst of the foes who would knock him down, knock him flat, and stop this mission, he's calling his family, his 12 disciples and those who would follow him, and he's giving them a, a mission, go out, and he's giving them authority, his authority, because they've got to stand against the kingdom of Satan. That's what's pictured by giving them authority to cast out demons. The tide of this world is against Christ and his word, and, and so we push back. With the authority of Christ on our lips and the power of his word in our hearts and in our mouths. And then he says, as his mother and brothers seek to come and take charge of him, what does he do? It's fascinating, isn't it? At the end of the section, he looks around at those who sat around him. Who are my mother and my brothers? No, he's not being disrespectful. He's taking the opportunity to redefine his family and make this point about those who belong to him. Who are my mother and my brothers, my sisters for that matter? Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That's key. What is the will of God? Well, surely in this context is to accept Jesus, not reject him, not cast him off as evil or mad. It's accept him as the Bible presents to him. As to him, he's God, he's king. He is Christ. He is your Messiah. He is Savior. You need Him. Those who do so do the will of God. And they then come into and belong to His family. And that, friends, is the same thing I think He's saying in that terrifying passage of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, friend, if you're truly His, you cannot blaspheme the Spirit. It's not about what you say. Sometimes you feel, oh, I've said something bad. I blaspheme, is God going to accept me? I'm in peril of the eternal sin. No. Friend, what this is in its context, in this context of rejection, to blaspheme the Spirit is to do what? Is to reject the Spirit's work. What is the Spirit's work? It's to bring it to conviction through faith in Christ. To bring it to Christ, to put the spotlight on Jesus, to show you Him, to convict your heart. To blaspheme the Spirit is to reject His work. And of course, if you reject the Spirit's work, you cannot be saved. You are condemned eternally. It's clear, it's on Jesus' lips. It's not some mad pastor's idea. Jesus says it. And you're in peril. But of course, if you bow the knee to Jesus, by His Spirit, He opens your eyes. Because we are the blind ones. We are the deaf ones. We fail to grasp the truth of Jesus. But if you grasp it, if you see it, and he opens your eyes by his Spirit, you're forgiven, no longer guilty of an eternal sin. You see? All of you, before you trusted Jesus, if you're a Christian here today, were once guilty of that eternal sin, for you rejected Jesus. But when you bow the knee to him, when you trust him, no longer does that hang over your head. You are going to be welcomed eternally into his family from now and forever. You see, that in its context is what blasphemy of the Spirit is about. It's not what you say. It's how you respond to his Son. Making Jesus something is not. There is only one option. He is Lord and King. It's as clear as day. Now you can fluff a bit. You can claim it's something else. You can throw all your objections out and your questions. 
But all you'll do is delay the inevitable. An inevitable march towards eternal damnation. Or will you bow the knee, even today, and acknowledge this King? For his family is the best place to be. His family is the best place to be. Under his wings, eternally protected, commissioned with purpose in this life, to proclaim the King. There is nothing better to do, but oh, it's hard. That's why it's placed here in the middle of this calling of the disciples. He's preparing them for a tough time. It is, isn't it? But it is worth it. Are you part of the King's team? The King's family? Will you trust Him still today? Will you stop rejecting Him? It's the best decision you can make, friend. And guess what? You gain a family who loves you dearly, even though you may be rejected by your own family for trusting Jesus, for taking him seriously. You might be labeled fanatic or mad yourself, or even bad. But you have family, brothers and sisters and mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers. It's glorious. It's bright. Maybe just take time and quiet to ponder your heart. Maybe just, as a believer here, if you want to thank God for drawing you to himself. For saving you from eternal condemnation. For giving you hope. For giving you purpose and meaning in his team, his mission team. For giving you a one anotherness in life with the family of God all across the world. We are united to our persecuted brothers and sisters and we should feel their pain and hurt and be humbled by their commitment to you. And maybe you want to do business with God and make that step which you know you have not yet done to trust Jesus with all your heart, to stop playing about Realize this is serious business before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, forgive us, Father, for making so little of King Jesus in our lives. Forgive us for being so distracted by nonsense. Forgive us for striving for success in a worldly way. Forgive us for not seeing, hearing, and grasping the truth of the magnificent King Jesus. And help us, Father. Help us to take together as your family, to get to grips again with your mission, your purpose, to call people to repent and believe the truth of the gospel. Empower us again as a leadership to have that focus on this coming Saturday. Empower us as a church to be joined together in that cause above all causes. We know that that will be risk, sacrifice, surrender. It is a small thing in the light of our eternal salvation that you have won through your blood on the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more.